This episode is a part of a special series for Global Entrepreneurship Week Fort Worth. Global Entrepreneurship Week, or GEW, is a week-long celebration of entrepreneurship held all around the world from November 8th through the 12th. You can participate in an array of hybrid sessions from educational workshops to pitch competitions to networking opportunities and more. Join in on the fun this year by registering at gewfortworth.org. That's gewfortworth.org. But if we really want to be viewed as a place where entrepreneurs can come and find a friendly environment for all, all things growth, the venture capital piece has got to be part of it. It just has to be. And they all need capital. And so we've got to, I mean, just our little piece is very focused, but we've got to help develop a much broader um, uh, venture capital community here. Welcome to Innovate Fort Worth, the podcast where we highlight local innovation and the people bringing those innovations to market. I'm Cameron Cushman, and on today's episode, I have the pleasure of talking to someone who's been leading the transformation of the economic development landscape in Fort Worth for almost 40 years. Mike Berry is the president of the Hillwood Group and has led the development of Alliance Airport and the associated real estate projects in Northern Tarrant County since 1988. More recently, he's focused on the Mobility Innovation Zone, or the MIS, that utilizes Alliance's one-of-a-kind infrastructure to offer visionaries a testing environment, resources, and partnerships to test, scale, and commercialize mobility-related technologies. He's had a transformative economic impact on our region and has some exciting things in the works around autonomous vehicles and drone delivery services. Mike, welcome to Innovate Fort Worth. Cameron, thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. So first off, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your personal connection to Fort Worth. Well, I grew up in Fort Worth. I was born at what is now THR. Back then it was Harris Hospital uh, downtown and um, spent my early years here through high school, then left for high school, uh, went to school in Virginia, then Vanderbilt, then back to Fort Worth to TCU to get my MBA. And that was the early 80s, and the Dallas-Fort Worth area was booming at that time, all kinds of new construction and development, and I became pretty fascinated with real estate. So during my MBA tenure, I was fortunate to get an internship with Ray Hunt's company, Woodbine Development, and that was the beginning of my real estate career. That turned into a full-time job, and then shortly thereafter, seven years later, uh, Ross Pro Jr. began the development of Alliance Airport, and um, I took a leap of faith, I guess, uh, which really wasn't a big, a big leap of faith. I thought it was at the time, and uh, been been doing it ever since. There you go, and, and I know your this history is is really closely linked to Ross Pro Jr. How did you guys meet, and and how did how did that conversation go about bringing you onto the Alliance project? So Ross and I were fraternity brothers at Vanderbilt. I actually he was a year behind me. I actually rushed him into our fraternity. <laughs> Very good. But uh, he, if you had known the two of us in college, you would have never had predicted that we would have been business partners and have worked together for now 33 years. Um, he became president of the fraternity. I was the social chairman, so I was in charge of parties. Party and planning, He was in right. charge of keeping us out of trouble, <laughs> That's uh, great. which is pretty much the same way it works today. Um, but anyway, we so he, he was flying jets in the Air Force Reserve, and his last base was what is now JRB here in Fort Worth, Carswell. So he would come by after work, or after he'd finished flying, he'd come by the office and we'd talk real estate. And during a 
period of over probably a year of conversations, the whole idea of Alliance Airport was also working. He was working with the FAA, the city, and um, as it became more of a reality and, and they knew it was going to get funded and constructed, he continued to ask me if I would join the team and help. And I didn't know anything about aviation. I knew a lot about real estate, but I didn't know anything about aviation or airports. Um, and so I was a little reluctant and this went on for months and finally uh, he came to see me and asked me again to, to join and I went home and, and told my wife and she said, you need to do it because if the airport doesn't work, you and Ross will figure something out. So uh, that was it. Well, take we, wife, wife, wife advice. There good you go. That's advice. good. That's yeah. good. So take me back to some of those early discussions, though, because when Alliance was proposed, I mean, that was that was kind of a crazy idea. Nobody else was doing that. It was super innovative, but but clearly there was a vision there. And then there was, uh, you know, sort of the will to execute and make that happen. What were some of those early discussions like? And I, I got to imagine you had a lot of detractors as well. So we're here talking about innovation. I, I tell people when, when we're talking about our mobility innovation zone at Alliance, I often start with the story of Ross Pro Jr. and Ross Pro Sr. really because Alliance and even things that Mr. Perot did Sr. before Alliance were all way ahead of their time. I mean, he was truly an innovator. Alliance Airport was the first industrial airport to be built in this country, not only by its design, because no one had ever built something for large industry as opposed to either small general aviation or commercial passenger, but it was also unique in that it was built in a public-private partnership where all parties came together, federal, state, local, and private sector to drive it. Private sector, we were given a lot of the keys to move faster than normal. You couldn't do probably what we did then, today. Um, but beyond the airport, we didn't really know what it might allow us to create or what, what it might bring. I mean, we thought we were building an airport, so we're, we're gonna focus on aviation companies because they need to be on an airport. But we never really thought about the total integration of transportation infrastructure, logistics, supply chain, and you know the way the world works now and has evolved, we really didn't understand it at the time. And so we were there at, on the front row watching it evolve and trying to take advantage of what we had and the opportunities that came our way, and that's what's happened. One thing has led to another, one deal has led to another, one relationship with a company has led to another, and, and it's, it's grown and evolved. Yeah, because looking back, it makes sense, because if you think about this notion of like intermodal transport, right? You, you, you built the airport, obviously, in ranch land. I mean, there was nothing there, but you're sitting on, you know, really the corridor of I-35 and not too far away from I-30, right? Two major roads, two major thoroughfares, but then you also have BNSF and, and the rail lines that go through there. So. Was that, so that was just kind of an accident that it all kind of came together? Or, or tell me more about how that kind of developed over time. The, it wasn't an accident that the rail line was adjacent to the runway. Um, because, you know, we had always thought about, is there a way to tie it in to a more of an integrated global transportation story? But really what we found early on, there's not a lot of linkage between freight that moves by rail and freight that moves by air. They're t really totally different categories just because of the time and value of the, those products that go either way. But what we, what we were fortunate to learn is that the railroad was innovating at the time and the whole idea of intermodalism was emerging. Intermodalism is the movement of steamship containers, ocean freight containers and or uh, domestic trailers, truck trailers on the backs of flatbed rail cars. And the advantages of intermodalism are the efficiency that you get of combining what we all talk about last mile today. Well, th this was they were way ahead of their time. It was the efficiency of linking a long haul, say from the port of LA to Texas, and back to your point, being in the center of the country was a huge yeah. advantage for us. Dallas-Fort Worth was not considered a major logistics hub in the early 90s. Hmm. It was really Chicago, Memphis, Columbus, 
LA, the, the seaport, the east and west coast ports, we were not for because our population growth really hadn't accelerated like it has. Today we're, you know, arguably one of the one of the fastest growing logistics hubs. But watching that intermodal business grow with BNSF created gave us an opportunity to create a strong partnership with them because we were trying to understand. And they helped us understand that we had a very strategic location in the country to become an inland port. And we so we helped them develop what is now, we just went to number one, our intermodal hub at Alliance is now the, the largest in their system. We just passed Hobart, California. Wow. We're doing like 1.2 million containers a year. We're, we're the equivalent of the port of Houston in terms of volume. So as an inland port to be equivalent to a major seaport is pretty significant. So that's one big thing that kind of opened our eyes to how do you integrate all of this stuff together and, and that helped us start to bring other companies in who wanted to take advantage of that efficiency of basically being next to a port. That's fascinating and, and there's no navigable river, we're really far away from no. the ocean, but you guys made this inland port a reality that definitely probably seemed crazy at the time, but now, you know, you're number one. I mean, I think that's, a, that's incredible. We used to joke, uh, actually, Speaker Jim Wright, who was Speaker of the House at the time, used to kind of talk about this big idea of dredging the Trinity River <laughs> wow. from Houston, from the Gulf Coast, all the way up to Fort Worth to create a true port, and we were able to, to do it, you know, without having to... I actually never create a, water, a navigable waterway. That's fascinating, I've never heard that. But, but you mentioned the public-private partnerships that had to come into play on this. Talk a little bit about that from not only the government entities, but also just how did you know, Ross Pro Jr. and his vision play within the companies like the BNSFs of the world, and I'm guessing trucking companies and others. How did that public-private partnership come together in the formation of this, but also as it's evolved over time? Um, it was, you know, I often tell people you probably could not do what we did today just because of the environment we live in, particularly the political environment we live in. But at that time, we had um, Speaker of the House Jim Wright, who was from Fort Worth. On the other side of the county line, an alliance airport straddles Tarrant and Denton County. So we had Speaker Wright went up to the county line for Tarrant on the Tarrant side. The other side was Dick Armey, who wow. became, he was an emerging yeah. Republican uh -huh. leader. So Speaker Wright was Democrat, right. Dick Armey was Republican. So you had bipartisan leadership in the House, both pulling for this project. So that was very unique. Gib Lewis was the Speaker of the Texas House of Representatives, and he was from Fort Worth. And Mayor Bob Bolin, probably the most important one of that whole group, Fort Worth Mayor Bob Bolin was the president of the National League of Cities, which is the National Conference of Mayors. So we had literally, at the local, state, and federal level, all of those leaders who were supportive of the development of Alliance and this whole idea of creating a, a massive economic development engine all lined up and all, all rowing the boat in the same direction. That was like the political perfect storm yeah, almost. Yeah, it was. Wow. This, I mean, the stars were totally lined up. Wow. So that, that really, to me, that was the key to, to making it happen. But Ross's vision and his ability to really sell the potential uh, and convince people, because you're right, we did have a lot of detractors. I mean, we would, I would pick up the Star Telegram every morning and there was a, some sort of negative article about, you know, boondoggle or yeah. that sort of thing. But it worked. It worked. They, they were wrong. So tell me about the Mobility Innovation Zone. I, obviously, we like to focus on innovation on this, on this podcast, but how did it start? Was it a natural outgrowth of what had already been happening there? And, and, and what do you see as the vision for this? What do you hope to accomplish with the MIS, the Mobility Innovation Zone? About four years ago, um, I got a call from um, a man who we've done a lot of work with over the years who rep, who worked for Uber, represented Uber. And he said, Uber is launching their Uber Elevate business strategy, which was their strategy to develop uh, what are called eVTOLs, electric vertical and takeoff, uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing 
aircraft to connect in with their surface network so that they can become complete door-to-door -door in every urban market and cut the time down. Which, you know, everybody that I tell that story to goes, oh, the Jetsons and, you know, flying yeah. cars. But it was, there, and, and they really were the fire starter in the industry for this whole idea, which is now growing as a whole segment of the industry. But anyway, we sat down, said, yeah, we, we'd love to meet with them. They needed a partner to help them think about working with the local governmental agencies and FAA to get acceptance to building a series of vertiports. Since we had built an airport, since we worked in aviation, since we knew a lot of the governmental leaders, since we were real estate people, we kind of checked all the boxes for them as, 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 a, as a good partner. So we began to work with Uber. Um, as, we, as we got further down the road with them, what we realized was all of the technology needed to create a whole new ecosystem of urban air mobility is the same technology that's needed on the ground, on the surface. It's 5G, it's LiDAR, it's um, battery charging infrastructure, the batteries themselves, the AR and the VR technology that gets attached to all these vehicles that allows them to drive safely down the road is the same technology that was being used on the air side. And so we started to look at the ecosystem. We said, okay, if you start with urban air mobility and move down, what's happening with the drone world and what's happening on the ground with electric or autonomous vehicles, particularly on the freight side. And that opened the, our eyes to the fact that all of our big customers at Alliance, Amazon, Walmart, FedEx, UPS, BNSF Railway, all were advancing the study of new mobility technologies in their businesses about freight movement, not about people movement. So we, you know, we're a little slow, but we said, hmm, pretty interesting emerging industry here. We have a 27,000 acre platform, 63,000 people working here, 533 companies, rail, air, airspace, control of streets. What better laboratory to stand up for all these technologies to advance and develop and test than right here? So thanks to Uber, which opened our eyes to the whole building emerging ecosystem, we basically came back home to Alliance and said, that this, this is an opportunity for us to really use this infrastructure platform and this working uh, micro economy to help the industry advance, if that makes sense. It, it, it totally does, and, and, and I think you not only have the infrastructure piece, but you mentioned those, would you say, 533 companies that are there? So everybody from Walmart and FedEx, but I bet you've got some, some startups or maybe some under the radar companies that nobody really knows about yet that are all operating there. And they're all after the same thing, which is logistics, efficiency, faster movement of freight and goods. How, how, do, I, how do I look to the future and, and not be the next company that's disrupted? How did, how did how did that realization come together of having the companies there that were all kind of rowing in the same direction and yet competing with each other? So we went, first we went to BNSF because I'm, as, as I said before, they've been a 30 year partner of ours and have taught us a lot about, about logistics, supply chain, movement of, of goods. And we began to ask them, what, what are you doing? Are you doing electric, uh, uh, movement, are you using autonomous vehicles or electric vehicles inside your intermodal yards to move containers from point A to point B? And yes, they were. And so we started to ask them about, okay, charging infrastructure, what do you need? What, what's the latest and greatest? Who are the best developers of the trucks that actually are working? And we began to get introduced to this whole new array of early stage companies that they had already identified and were giving them a chance to stand up their technologies in their facilities. So we started talking to the companies they were working with and said, what if we could give you a bigger platform? What if you could, what if we could locate you at Alliance and you could do your work with BNSF and there are these other customers here and you could plug into the, there's 3,500 trucks a day 
coming in and out of the gate of the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Intermodal Hub. Wow. So just think about the volume of commerce that is moving every day up and down these roads and the opportunity for these guys. So we started to talk to companies like ITS Con Global and Phantom and Gaddick and Too Simple. All these companies that most people don't even know about today, but they are all advancing different pieces of the technology in this ecosystem. And those, from those discussions, we began to say, well, what do you need? How can we stand you up here? How can we help you plug in? And we're now actually doing business with all of them in various pieces of alliance. Uh, we've built buildings for them. We've leased space to them. We're helping them connect with other companies. And, and, but, and, but it's not a true incubator. These are all, these, all of these companies were already developing. We just gave them a chance to advance. You give them a fast. laboratory, you give them a test bed, right. you gave them a place to, to take what they were working on in the lab and, and see if it worked in the real world. But tell me about some of the successes maybe you've had in the Miz so far, and then give me a portrait of the future. What does this look like in five to 10 years, and, and what does success look like? Well, on the, on the surface side, we've had some great successes. I mentioned Too Simple. They're one of the leading. If you saw the 60 Minutes piece about three weeks ago, they were showcased in 60 Minutes' um, segment on autonomous trucking and the advancement of autonomous trucking. Um, and they are now doing actual long haul shipping with autonomous trucks on Texas highways and Arizona highways. Fortunately, Arizona and Texas are considered by, by the companies in that space to be the most uh, open hmm. to allowing that technology to, to drive on our, on our highways. So we just built for Too Simple a basically a hub from which they are launching long haul test shipments up and down 35 and up and down 45 from here to Austin and from here to from Alliance to Austin Alliance to Houston and they have a number of partners Walmart's one of their partners um, so that's actually happening now Wow uh, we also earlier this year on the air side uh, we did our first use case demonstration with Bell BNSF, Bell Helicopter, now just Bell, and BNSF, two local companies. We basically delivered a package with a Bell drone, it's called an APT-70. We delivered a package from Alliance Airport up the BNSF rail line, because they've already done so much work in, in using their rail quarters to develop drone delivery systems to one of our residential neighborhoods, Pecan Square, and drop the package in the center of the residential community to show how package delivery could literally go from a fulfillment center or a warehouse direct to the consumer via drone delivery, which is not far away, by the way. Wow, it's already that's happened. fascinating. So, so you're, you're already doing this. I mean, this is incredible. Yeah, and there's one customer I can't talk about uh, publicly uh, by name, but who is now using our flight test center at Alliance, which we built and developed for specifically for these drone guys to test. So they're up there doing um, multiple delivery tests every day with their drones, which is a different sort of system than we use with Bell, but they're actually taking packages in a controlled airspace environment and delivering them over and over again to show uh, the, the, the capabilities and also develop the, the technology. So you're gonna see, I think within the next year, here in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, you're gonna see actual delivery of products, limited, I think we're, we're under three pounds right now with, with what we're doing at Alliance but literally on your phone, you'll go to an app, you'll order uh, an item from say Walgreens or CVS um, or a food item from certain vendors that they're working with right now. You'll hit the app, the drone will be stationed at the location of where that product's coming from and it'll come straight to your front yard. 
and rather than have to land, this particular system actually drops the product with a cable. So you don't have to worry about navigating trees, overhead power lines, wow. that sort of thing. That's fascinating. So, so I it's, get very, my, it's very safe. So I can get my tacos delivered right to my front door. Absolutely. And they'll still Pizza, be hot. Pizza, tacos, hamburgers. Uh, they, they're barbecue. Doing, they're doing barbecue. coffee. I, I don't think they have a barbecue partner yet. <laughs> they're doing coffee, but I'm, you know, I'm not sure exactly how the coffee stays. It depends on the trip, but. That is fascinating. But it's they've done 20,000 um, uh, deliveries already in Australia, which is where they wow. started okay. testing. And now they're okay. bringing it here to the U.S. So the future's here. Yeah, and, and uh, UPS just announced yesterday, they're one of our big customers, they just announced in North Carolina they are delivering COVID vaccines wow. in partnership with one of the major healthcare huh. Uh, institutions in North Carolina so via drone so you're gonna see you're gonna see this really advance I think much much faster than people people realize that's fascinating so one of the other things too that you guys have begun to to match up with this is the capital aspect the 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 Perot Jane venture arm has kind of jumped in with you guys I know you're I know you're it's is early but you're beginning to kind of match the capital and the investment piece up with all the other innovation that's going on with the big companies the small companies the startups and everybody that's in the Miz tell me about how you think that's going to work and how that's going to fuel some of this development Perot Jane which is our one of our sister companies uh, that Ross started with his his uh, one of his former partners Anurag Jane was already very established in venture capital uh, investment in the technology space, but it was br that was broad. Um, and they had a sort of an interest really in, in healthcare uh, because of the work they did together at Pro Systems. As we started to work on the Miz, we realized that some of the companies we're being exposed to are really early stage and are in need of, of capital. Um, so we started to bring Perot Jane into a lot of our meetings and a lot of our MIS strategy development. And that has now developed to the point where we just created a new fund with, in partnership with them. So Hillwood, Perot Jane together, that is going to focus specifically on mobility innovation. And we're going to also have a little bit of a focus on prop tech because that, that carries into our real estate platform. Uh, but property technology. Property right? technology. Yes. With all the real estate software platforms that are emerging out there right. that are that are that are also pretty fun to watch. But we're gonna focus a lot of our efforts on mobility innovation and helping find companies that we like, that fit the MIS, that could be matches for some of our bigger corporate clients, and also have a, a high probability of success. Uh, so we've done a couple of deals, small deals so far, just to, to kind of get our feet wet. But we're starting to build a team and uh, we're really starting to try to wrap that into our, our total story. Because as you and I talked earlier, you know, we've, one of the things, if Fort Worth wants to really emerge as, I hate to say the next Austin, but if we really want to be viewed as a place where entrepreneurs can come and find a friendly environment for all all things growth the venture capital piece has got to be part of it yeah it just has to be and they all need capital and so we've got to i mean just our little piece is very focused but we've got to help develop a much broader um, uh, venture capital community here that makes so, sense and i think that's gonna be a great partnership to really just add add some gasoline to the, what you're already doing and, and really uh, take this to the next level so that's fantastic so you have this really unique seat where you're working with the Walmarts, the, the FedExes, you know, long considered some of these most innovative big, you know, corporations. But then you're also working on their, you know, early stage investments or early stage uh, innovations from drones and things like that. You've got the startup component to it. What's a trend that you're seeing from, from your very unique seat that may not be apparent to the rest of us to all of our listeners, what's something that you see on the horizon that uh, may not be as uh, obvious or as widely anticipated as autonomous trucking or drones or some of the other things that you've mentioned? Well, it's linked into to everything we've been talking about, but I'm really starting to see the impact 
on these, this technology at the consumer level. Um, so working with someone like Walmart, Walmart is way down the road in thinking about, particularly with their food and grocery business, how they actually will autonomously deliver food and groceries to your home. So that impacts, I mean, I talked about the drone drops earlier, but this is more about surface using robots that literally are able to, and you've seen some of FedEx's commercials on television probably of the robot in the neighborhood, but these are, these are actually working now and so now we're starting to think about, okay, how do you redesign the home to accept these sorts of devices actually delivering? And, and so it's ramps up to your front porch, it's lock boxes built into the front porch of your house wow. where these deliveries can be left. They even have use cases out there that they're looking at where with security systems that can be uh, disabled and then re-enabled how these devices can actually go into the house and place food in your refrigerator. Unbelievable. That's how, that's how advanced wow. they're thinking. So, you know, that, that one is hard for me to figure out how you get through security and, but with the redesign of homes and the products within, the appliances within those homes, you actually can, you can design for that to work. So um, those are, those are sort of the, kind of the next generation of things. We're, we're still, we're, we think we need to stay focused on point to point, you know, more B2B, full, you know, intermodal hub to fulfillment center. Um, retail store, maybe to a central drop pod, play, things like that that are more, you can advance more quickly. So the question we always ask on this show, uh, Mike, who is your favorite innovator in Fort Worth? Well, I, there's, there's one uh, individual that I'm pretty close to, Brad Hunstable, who I know has been on your yep. podcast. Uh, Brad actually used to work at Hillwood in his early, early part of his career. He's a veteran, as you probably know. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I followed the, the growth of Linear Labs, his company, which is the electric motor company that he established and has the patent for several engines. And, I, and the reason he's my favorite is I know him better than, than others, and I also love his energy. He's a big thinker. He's, he's got infectious energy. He's very positive. And his vision, which is similar to ours, I tell people I, we should be the Silicon Valley of mobility innovation. He wants to be the Silicon Valley or the center of electrification in Fort Worth. And so you, anyone who has that sort of passion and that sort of vision and that sort of drive to really change, not just, not just grow his own business, but really use what he's doing as a magnet for growth for the for the broader economy you gotta you gotta admire somebody like that so we're, I'm, I'm very supportive of brad we're big fans of brad as well and yeah and if you haven't checked out that episode do check it out it is really fascinating what he's doing and uh i think his technology has limitless potential i think i think you're absolutely right well mike thanks so much for joining me today on innovate fort worth if you'd like to learn more about alliance or about the mobility innovation zone go to alliance texas Dot com. That's AllianceTexas.com. Today's episode was produced by Kendall Rogers. Our technical producer is Rob Upchurch, and our digital editors are Matt Havlick and Summerlee Sherlock. Innovate Fort Worth is brought to you by the UNT Health Science Center, where we are driven to improve the human condition through a passion for innovation and teamwork. <laughs> Hey innovators, if you're a fan of the show, then we know you've heard about Global Entrepreneurship Week Fort Worth, which will run from November 7th through the 12th this year. We have several special things planned for this podcast, including bonus episodes and our first ever live recording. We're also planning an in-person meetup for previous guests and for fans of the show. On Thursday, November 11th, join us in person at the GEW Base Camp 
at 550 Bailey Avenue in Fort Worth for a live recording followed by a meetup for fans of the show. Come meet me and the other people that bring you this show and connect with some of our favorite guests from the podcast. Join us on Thursday, November 11th at 4.30 p.m. for this live recording and fan meetup. Go to the GEW Fort Worth website to learn more at gewfortworth.org. That's gewfortworth.org. We'll see you there.